You're absolutely right. The returns aren't going to be there in the more recent funds that you've been investing in. So what we look at, you know, did they execute on the strategies that they laid out to us, you know, when we were underwriting the previous funds, any material changes to the team, any material changes to the market. And then also, I think the most important thing is doing more of a deep dive into the companies themselves. So like, you know, when they made the original investment, you know, did everything go as they were expecting? And if not, why? And hopefully what you find is, yes, the investments in the companies that they made, everything is tracking as they expected. For more ideas on how to raise venture capital in this market, make sure to subscribe below. Chris, welcome to the 10X Capital Podcast. Thank you for the invitation. Looking forward to it. So Chris, you have an interesting background. You're, you're a son of Wisconsin and, and, and you've spent most of your life there. Uh, tell me how you became a portfolio manager at State of Wisconsin Investment Board, also known as SWIP. Yeah. So uh, yes, born and raised in Madison, started my career uh, here in Madison out of undergrad. Uh, went to go work for a regional bank uh, here in town, uh, which seems like a uh, hundred years ago, uh, but it, um, it was, uh, I joined SWIB in 2001. So um, when I was uh, at the bank, I was a commercial lender and I was working with middle market companies, uh, wholesale banking, commercial lending, and a few of the companies I worked with were technology companies. So that was probably in the mid nineties. Uh, so working with startups on the depository side, as well as on the lending side. And then in 2001, I left the bank and moved over to SWIB to help manage a private debt portfolio, which I still manage today. Um, and then in the mid 2000s, I took over responsibility of a regional venture capital portfolio, and we've grown and expanded that uh, portfolio over time. And today, it's primarily a U.S. focused venture fund, um, and we 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 tend to tilt more into IT, software, and tech enabled businesses from a sector perspective. And you mentioned private debt. Is is working and managing private debt portfolio somehow make you a better venture venture portfolio manager? So it, it gives you another lens or a different perspective. We do have lots of conversations with uh, venture debt funds. So it just brings another um, perspective uh, when working with startup companies. On the venture side, we're primarily focused on making uh, e basically equity investments, early stage equity investments directly into companies, as well as the fund commitments that we that we make to our to our managers. What do you think about venture debt? Where is venture debt today? And is it an attractive asset class? Yeah, I just had a conversation with a venture debt uh, manager a few days ago. You know, I, I think um, from a returns perspective, it, it does uh, continue to hold up even in this difficult market. I mean, they're, they're, the returns are in the kind of the mid-teens, primarily focused around cash pay interest, some pick and uh, an equity kicker or success fee. Um, the, the managers that we've looked at or talked to, the loss rates are still extremely low. Default rates are very low, so it seems like it's holding up. Um, now, I don't think we've seen the the depths just yet in venture, so there could be some additional stress. But I do think it is a it is an investable asset class from an institutional perspective. You guys have a hundred forty billion dollar fully funded pension plan. First of all, what does it mean to be fully funded? And then uh, tell me at a high level your asset allocation strategy. Yeah, so from a from a funding perspective, uh, the 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 assets that we have uh, or or are managing. Uh, actually can fund the liabilities of our beneficiaries. There are a lot of state plans that unfortunately aren't in the same position as us. So having that fully funded status, that liquidity and in good times and bad allows us to invest in all business cycles. A fund, a typical fund life, right, is 14, 15, 16 years. So having that long-term perspective um, is, is extremely important. Do you think venture returns are inherently counter-cyclical? Valuations are coming back down to a more what I'll call a normal level. Um, there's there's less capital available. And so the best entrepreneurs, the best companies are, are getting funded at, at better valuations. And over the long term, we think those will, will generate very nice returns for us. Chris, can you say more about what kind of GPs you, you like to back or what you look for in, in, in managers and how you think about just architecting a, portf a venture portfolio? Yep. So Eric, so we like early stage. We define early as C, Series A and Series B. And most of our later stage investing has been through the opportunity funds of our early stage managers. When we're looking at, at underwriting an early stage manager, fund size obviously is important. So David, you and I had some conversations about you know what type of a manager do you like to back? Fund size wise, we like to have uh, smaller funds we think is, is better uh, uh, from, a, from a, a multiple multiple and an IIR perspective. A manager that's raising a 350 to 450 size fund is a, is a good size for us. Now, obviously, you know, that's not the case in, in every situation. There are some managers that have raised billion dollar Series A funds and will participate in those, but the, we think that the, the manager is uh, has something special to them. Say more about 
uh, the, the type of managers you backed? Are, are some of them merging managers? Have they been long track record? Are they founders? W what kinds of archetypes do you have in the portfolio? All of the above. Are, we haven't been very active on the merging manager side. Most of the groups that we have backed have, have had a track record. So either that's a track record from a previous firm and maybe they're out raising fund two or fund three and we'll come in and make a commitment or it's an existing manager that we, it's a new relationship to us, but an existing manager that has a good track record. How are you guys able to deliver alpha at the scale that you're at? The individual or individuals that we back have to have some type of a track record, whether that be uh, a track record from a, a, a previous uh, fund that they were at or um, potentially, a, let's say, an angel track record. David Sachs is a great example, right? So a proven entrepreneur, um, uh, you know, early employee of PayPal, built that up, sold it, uh, went on to Yammer, had a really nice exit there, then basically started investing his own capital, had generated a great track record there, and then decided to professionalize or institutionalize um, and start craft. That's a, that, that for us, that's a good kind of emerging manager profile. What do you think is the trade-off between operator turned VC versus finance turned VCs? Having more of an operator background is probably a bit more important from a from an ability to to really help a founder if they do have a problem, whether that's building, you know, or building code or you know hiring the right individuals, but you know having that network, I think, is extremely important. Essentially, it's sourcing, picking, and winning. How do you guys rank those as imperative for for long term return of capital? Returns are something that we do look at, whether it's from a previous fund uh, that they worked at or their own, you know, uh, personal angel book. Um, and then again, we look at what what their background is, their experiences is, is. So, are they an operator? Are they a company builder or a founder and entrepreneur that's built businesses and sold businesses? Has walked in the shoes of the founder. We think that's 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 really important. And then we also look at the the team that they're able to kind of surround themselves with. We think we think having a good team is extremely important as well. And then obviously, you know, the sector that they're investing in. You know, is it is it a sector that we think has has likes to? It's going to continue to grow. What returns are you are compelling for you? We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsor. Most businesses use up to 16 tools to hire, manage, and pay their workforce. But there's one platform that's replaced them all. That's Deal. D-E-E-L. Deal is the all-in-one HR and payroll platform built for global work. The smartest startups in my portfolio use Deal to integrate HR, payroll, compliance, and everything else in a single product. Focus on what you do best, scale your business, and let Deal do the rest. Deal allows you to hire, onboard, and pay talent in over 150 countries, from background checks to built-in contracts. You can manage the entire worker lifecycle from a single and easy-to-use interface. Click the link in the show notes below to book a free, no-strings-attached demo with Deal today. So, you know, my view is if you look at the long-term net returns of venture, if you're if you're posting 25 to 30% net, that's a very strong, very strong venture portfolio. In terms of venture, as part of your portfolio, you guys are managing $140 billion. What is the purpose of venture and how does it interplay with other parts of your asset management strategy? Yeah, so I mean it's so it's a it's a relatively small overall asset allocation. So the, again, the core trust funds, you know, let's let's call it $140 billion. You know, the venture uh, allocation to the core trust fund is about 3%. So it's a very small piece of the overall uh, trust fund. That said, there are instances where if you get into the right fund or you get into the right company on a direct basis, you can have a meaningful contribution to the overall core trust fund returns. Given that it's only 3%, how much are you focused on diversification given that it's such a small piece of your overall portfolio? As I said before, um, we try and run a, I'll, I'll call it a concentrated book, so 25 managers. I think if you grow the manager base more than that, then you're probably more of a, it's more of a beta return, right? So, so uh, investing in a smaller number of managers and then doing some things on the margin like secondaries or direct investments that give you that alpha um, on top of kind of what the core, the core venture portfolio is, is providing. What is your strategy when it comes to directs? How do you avoid adverse selection? So, um, our, so we've been investing in directs since the early 2000s. We don't lead anything on our own. Um, so you can imagine with a pot of money, $140 billion, we have a lot of companies that will call us um, and seek financing. And, and what, we'll, what we'll do is we'll, um, refer, if, it, if we think it's a good team, a good technology, a big market, and that we think that business can scale, we'll actually refer it out to one of our managers. And then if our manager invests, um, you know, we can actually make a direct investment alongside of the fund. Um, so to, to avoid adverse selection, David, I think the most important thing for us is to do our due diligence up front and underwrite our managers and make sure that we really understand how they think about investing. 
um, and get to know the, the, the partners, um, what they're looking at, what they're seeing. Um, and then uh, the other thing too, is we, we uh, make sure we communicate to them what we're looking for um, in direct opportunities. You guys have probably one of the most unique governance structures for a $140 billion pool of capital. So tell me about that. Tell me about how you interact with your investment committee and how that's a source of advantage for you guys. We're very fortunate to, to have a fully funded pension plan and it gives us a lot of flexibility. We call it the SWIB edge. So the governance structure of the Wisconsin Retirement System and SWIB gives SWIB staff the investment discretion. So our board of trustees sets our guidelines, our investment guidelines. And as long as we stay within those investment guidelines, we have the ability to make the investments that we're underwriting and looking at. The review and approval process is pretty flat. So it's essentially me sitting down with my my, my CIO of, of, of private markets. We don't have to wait around for you know a, a, a monthly investment committee or, or a loan committee or a board of trustee committee that meets on a quarterly basis to get our, our, our investments approved. We can, we can move pretty fast. We actually, we did a, um, this goes back about two years, but um, we got a phone call from a GP. It was a, it was a later stage transaction. Um, they had a little bit left of a round to fill. They called us on a Thursday and uh, we got approval over the weekend and we closed the following week, which is pretty fast for a, a public pension plan. Let's get controversial. Uh, so I know for you, DPI is a big, is a big important thing in a fund. <laughs> and of course, of course, in this kind of uh, market cycle, of course, I love, I love DPI as well, both as a GP, as an LP, but I would argue DP is a hugely lagging indicator. Why am I wrong in saying that DPI is a lagging indicator? The first DPI is important, right? DPI, DPI will come back. I think GPs are actually a little more focused about DPI. Most of the meetings that we're having now, they're spending a little bit more time on their philosophy on how to either generate or manufacture liquidity. So let's say uh, I have a $300 million fund. I have a position I put in $20 million. It's marked at $500 million today. It's up 25X. As an LP that's highly diversified and investing at a 3% pool, what would be your advice for how I should manage the liquidity on that? And I would ask of the GP is like, what was your target return? Like what? What were you looking to, to to generate or turn in that particular investment? And if it if it exceeded that level, that amount, then maybe it makes some sense to take some dollars off the table. Uh, my my view is you know don't sell a hundred percent of the position down, but you know maybe thirty percent, and then you've got you know what you know seventy eighty percent of the remaining holdings uh, to 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 generate some significant upside if you still have high conviction in the business. And tell me about your philosophy when it comes to your portfolio. Yeah, so we would we would we would like our managers swing a bit more for the fences, and that's why we're investing more on the early stage. Explain to me the the practical limits to adding more managers. Why can't you manage a portfolio of 100 managers? It's a resource resource issue, right? So we don't. I mean, I don't have a, a 10 member team, so there there are some resources that we need to factor in. That number of managers is probably dilutive to the overall returns of the portfolio. And then if you're managing a hundred managers, you can't, I don't think you can really develop close relationships with the, the people that you're investing in. And I think developing, you know, venture is a relationship business, developing close relationships, you tend to get better opportunities. So we want to, again, we'd like to run a more, a more concentrated book. And one way that you can augment, you know, if you, if you, if you only want 20 to 30 managers in the portfolio, one way you can augment that is you can do secondaries, both funds and directs, you can do opportunity funds. So there's ways to scale the portfolio up a bit, but um, but not dilute the overall returns that you're looking for. So you're looking to re-up and you don't have, certainly don't have DPI. You probably don't even have TVPI to base your re-up decisions. What are you basing your re-up decisions on? You're absolutely right. The returns aren't going to be there in the more more recent funds that you've been investing in. So what we look at, you know, did they execute on the strategies that they laid out to us, um, you know, when we were underwriting the, the previous funds? Any material changes to the team, any material changes to the market. And then also, I think the most important thing is, is doing more of a deep dive into the companies themselves. So like, you know, when they made the original investment, is the company two years later at plan, you know, did everything go as, as they were expecting? And if not, why? And hopefully what you find is, yes, the, the investments in the companies that they made, everything is tracking as they, as they expected. So that's one way to kind of work on, uh, on diligencing a manager if you don't yet have, have any returns in the, in the bank. Do you have a, a part of your venture portfolio that's almost like an automatic re-up and then some people on the fence? We can invest in everybody, unfortunately, sometimes tough decisions and cut loose the managers that for whatever reason are, aren't performing. When do funds get too big such that it doesn't make sense to re-up? That's the billion dollar question. Like I said before, you know, 300 to 400, 450 is just, it's a, it's a nice size fund. 
And if you run a, if the GP runs a concentrated LP base, so you get a decent allocation and you can really, if, you know, if there's a couple of companies in there, they're home runs, you can really drive returns. My sense is that when VCs back founders, founders pivot too, right? But my sense is that VCs are, uh, are perhaps more flexible or more interested in the founders pivoting if they've noticed a new opportunity. And maybe LPs have more of a sense for what they want because they have a portfolio and say, hey, if you're covering SaaS, we don't want you to do crypto because we're already in crypto. I think what you're getting to is portfolio construction. So yeah. let me construct a portfolio how I see fit versus having my, my manager do that, do that for me. When you're talking to your peers, people who do the same exact thing as you, what um or look at the same managers are there any common disagreements you find yourself uh or, or, or ways in which you see the world references are such a big part of evaluating managers what are maybe a non-obvious question or a non-obvious thing you're looking to assess when you do references of your managers to identify or uh, you know prospective managers hey is this someone you know we want to be in business with we'll get right back to the interview but first to stay updated on all things emerging managers and limited partners including industry trends and insights on how to raise lp capital please subscribe to our newsletter powered by Caria Labs, a full-service content marketing firm that's partnered with us on the newsletter. Visit 10X Capital Podcast to subscribe. That's www.10xcapitalpodcast.com. Thank you. From a reference standpoint, we obviously like to talk to entrepreneurs that, that our, our managers have backed, um, both put good outcomes and bad outcomes. So you want to see you know, how, how did they work through difficult situations. We also like to talk to uh, co-investors of the manager. So how, you know, how do they... How do they work on the board? Are they are they you know um, constructive um, or not? How many references are you looking for on a on a new new relationship? For a brand new relationship, so we'll probably do anywhere between five to ten calls. It really depends. So a lot of times we'll we'll kind of know the manager or have been following the manager. It's pretty rare that we'll like uh, meet a manager and then kind of roll right into to diligence and a closing. So a lot of times we've been talking to managers for a while. So you get to know them. You get to go to an AGM or two get to meet some of the L their LPs, some of their LPAC members. So you build a relationship over time. And then when they come back to market, you're in a better position to pull the trigger. Well, Chris, you know, somebody who grew up in the Midwest, and I know Eric went to University of Michigan. And, uh, you know, when you're on the coast, the entire Midwest is like a state. So it, it's it's been great to chat. Uh, and it's been thank you for sharing everything with the audience. What would you like our audience to know about you, uh, about SWIB, or about anything else you'd like to shine a light on? Um, you know, I... I I guess what I would say is, you know, our, our, our approach to venture isn't like static. You know, we are, we think we're dynamic investors. Venture is an important asset class for us. I mean, we've been investing in venture since 1985. Um, continue to try and build uh, stronger, deeper relationships with our existing GPs, but also just want to leave the audience with, we are open to uh, new opportunities as well. So we like to meet with as many managers as we can. Um, it makes me a better investor. Uh, I get to see what other people are interested in thinking about and investing in. So uh, we welcome those, uh, those, those, those conversations.